So hello everybody. At the end of the 80s and early 90s, every professional music studio as well as all the home studios had to have one computer, the Atari ST. And if you're a regular watcher of my YouTube channel, if not, you should subscribe to it. You have seen maybe the Kawaii K4R video, for which I installed an Atari ST emulator to run different K4 librarians and editors. And this worked totally fine. And from that on, I went down the rabbit hole into this old computer and all the different versions it had, the software it had, and I learned so many things which I was absolutely not aware of. Then I thought, should I do a video about this? Because there's already tons of Atari ST videos on the internet, but there are pretty rare videos which talk about the aspects of making music with it. So this video looks more into the making music side and also the music hardware there was and these things. But let's dive into. The journey starts as Jack Tremiel took over Atari and before that he was working actually for Commodore. So the paths of Commodore and Atari were much closer as many people are aware of. And even the designer of the Atari ST, Shiraz Shivi, was previously also working on a Commodore C64. So two of the most well-known home computers at the time. And he set on this journey to develop this new computer in only six months with a team of six people. And finally, in 1985, they released the first versions. There was the 520 ST, which was the main flagship device, which had half a megabyte of memory and a little stripped down version. And they also had a plans for a 130, which would have only 128 kilobytes. So this would be even for these days, not a big jump up from a Commodore C64. So they simply removed that version. But what made this computer such a success? So one of the main reasons was it had a really big resolution for the time of 640 to 400 pixels and it was a flicker-free monochrome monitor. So quite a statement at that time. Then furthermore, it was compatible with reading and writing MS-DOS disks and last but not least, the price. So it undercut massively the Amiga, for example, from Commodore, as well as the IBM PCs in price and was much cheaper. So this was a good reason to start. But looking at what musicians need, it had a rather crappy sound chip, Yamaha standard chip, which had three voices and some noise. But even for that time, it was pretty bad. But what made it much more interesting was the MIDI interface. So it had a MIDI input and a MIDI output. So you could straight away start making music with that computer and a synthesizer, which had a MIDI input, which was really, really great at that time because interfaces, external interfaces cost really lots of money back then. And then there were many, many different versions of the ST. So the first versions, soon after the release, they had a plus version, the 520 ST plus, which had already one megabyte. And then they turned and switched over to the 1040 models. And this indicates already the size of the main memory. So 2040 stands for one megabyte and 524 half a megabyte. So they just rounded it a bit to make it look nicer. Until I did this research, I had no idea what these letters stands for. So this is really interesting. So the S and T, S stands for 16 bit and T for 32 bit, which means 16 bit is the size of the data bus of the 68,000 main processor for Motorola. And it had a 32 bit instruction set, which was also not that common at the time. It's also noteworthy that the same chip was in Amiga as well as the Macintosh at that time. And going on, F stood for floppy. So the first models had an external floppy disk and then the models which had an internal floppy had added this F to the name. Then there were versions which could be directly connected to a TV, which had then this 
M for modulator, for the TV modulator. And later on, there were the enhanced models, which had this little E assigned to them. And they featured a blitter chip, so additional chip for doing helpful calculations and a bigger color palette. But after that, the Mega ST arrived. So the computer I was lusting after as well and could not afford at all. And I think still up till today, it has a really, really nice, impressive layout in comparison to the horrible IBM PCs, for example. And it featured basically the same system, but you could now get up to four megabyte, as well as in the same layout, you could get hard disks. So external hard disks were the new thing you could get, and they were basically as big as a whole computer. So really, really large stuff at the time. It's also worth mentioning how quick the evolution happened back then. So only one year later, they had a fully new computer. And yeah, what is also featured on that one is the MIDI interface is still there and still present. So the Mega ST was a real music computer. And then I learned also about a prototype device, which never was released, but there are some prototypes of this model do exist. And some people also own them. It was a four. 4160 STE and remember at the acronym so the first number stands for the size so this indicates that it has four megabytes of main memory so basically a mega ST4 but in the old casing and then after four years more of waiting then arrived the TTO 30 and 030 stands now for the new processor, the 68,030 processor, which was a huge improvement in comparison to the previous 68,000 models. And it featured also a new layout, which is interesting looking, but I think not as nice as the old models. And still it featured the MIDI input and outputs. And there was also a laptop version, the Stacy, which showed up in 1992. And it was intended to be used on the go, but it turned out that the battery was so crappy, it ran only for 20 minutes and then died out. So they even released the model without the battery because it wasn't usable at all and simply sold it as a mobile device and not as a real laptop. And back then, these were really huge and massive things, but the model from the other companies did not look much different back then and it's interesting to note these also did feature the MIDI interfaces. And there was then a much nicer looking model the ST. This looked much more like a modern nowadays laptop. And there are really people who think that the iPad was the first tablet <laughs> ever introduced. No, there were many other tablets before that. And there was also a prototype by Atari, which was never released, the ST pad. And yeah, sadly, this did also not feature the MIDI interface. So for musicians, not that impressive. And they had a second version, the stylus, both prototypes, which sadly never got released. And then we are already on to the last ever Atari ST model, the Falcon 030, also featuring the 6830 processor. And it featured again the MIDI input and output. So it looked pretty identical, but it had a huge improvement, especially for musicians. It had a DSP processor in there. And with that, you could do audio recording. So the first thing, and this was really impressive back then because for digital audio recording, they had only very, very expensive external gear. So this was really new that you could run on a home computer, a recording studio, and with Cubase Audio, which we will have a look on later, could even play back up to 16 tracks, which was unbelievable back in the days. But this is not fully the end. So Atari stopped developing. They focused on the game part more, which was also a big failure, sadly. But a German company, C-Lab, which was very famous for their creator and notator software, their sequencer software back then, they 
got a license from Atari to continue the development and also to release more things. So there was then the Falcon Mark I as well as a Mark II, which were basically the same Falcon model, but with some improved audio capabilities. So then finally showed up a Falcon MKX, which even had proper digital interfaces as well as proper audio connectors directly on the device. Sadly, there are only some horrible images of it available and it's a very, very rare device. But there was even a test in the well-known UK magazine Sound on Sound. And this is also linked down in the description of the video if you want to read about that thing. Yeah, and by the way, all the different links to all the stuff I'm talking about in this video are down in the description, so just check that out and this will give you tons of further reading. And what we also need to talk about is the tons of extensions and modifications which were available for all the different models. So there were turbo cards which sped up the original Atari STs. There were memory expansion which you could also blow up the old models up to 4 megabyte. There were even specific graphic cards like graphic cards you know from today. Also I think an Nvidia model was there which were working with the Atari STs. It's crazy. And also this drive from different manufacturer and there were PC emulator cards so you could emulate in hardware a PC with the Atari ST which is also very funny also back then there were a Mac a Macintosh emulator which ran faster on the ST than on the original Macintosh computer which made Apple not very happy and lots of people switched to ST to also run their old Apple software and the new Atari ST software then there were crazy things like uh, switches for the operating system versions and then different adapters for the SCSI hard disk as well as IDE controllers later on, network cards, there were even browsers later on. So you could even join the internet with good old Atari STs and lots of digitizers and frame grabbers were the big things back then. But in the final days of the Ataris, Apple also sniffed some morning fresh air to win over the Atari people to the Mac side. And there was an emulator called the Magic Mac. So Magic was an emulator for the Mac, which was improved for quite a long time. And they had even these ads to win people over. And they say it can be run on Magic Mac on a PowerBook much better than on an Atari ST. So come over to the Apple side, which is something I cannot imagine that Apple would do nowadays. But this did not stop the development of Atari's STs. There were clones, so there were Falcon clones, one which the hardest from Medusa computer systems and the very well-known Milan computer. There was also a Milan 2 in the development, which was sadly never released. And there is a quite new Firebee computer, which was also a clone, but based on a Coldfire processor, which is 68 compatible. So this is quite interesting, as well as nowadays you can get FPGA based versions. FPGA, if you have never heard about this, are chips which can emulate in hardware other chips. So pretty crazy technology. And if you search for MIST, these are implementations of these things which can also emulate other computers as well. So the Commodore 64, lots of gaming consoles and also the Amiga and these things. So if you get such a device, you can emulate lots of different hardware on one device. And something I was absolutely not aware about, so this needs to be mentioned as well, Atari also built PCs, so totally insane. In the first version, quite similar looking than the ST versions, but I guess the monitor somewhere had to be more ugly <laughs> in this horrible orange. And then the follow-up systems looked much more like normal IBM PCs, so the pretty boring office stuff. And they went up to version five of these things until they also did stop this development. But switching over to the software side, so first we need an operating system and this was bought mainly from other companies and also partially developed together with Atari and this were the TOS. Many people, including me, were thinking it stands for Tremiel operating system, but actually it simply means 
the operating system, which is even more insane and boring. But nevertheless, it was mainly designed by Digital Research DRI together with a bit of Atari as well. And it could run only a single task. So this was also nothing very surprising back then that you could run only one software program at the time. And only a few years later, Multitos showed up for the Falcon, which could then also run well-behaved programs. <laughs> so all the previous software used a lot of tricks to get the best out of the ST, and these tricks did just fail on Multitos. So it was only partially usable with newer software. Looking a bit at Torso, there was a first version for the first ST series and then with the show up of the Mega ST version 2 showed up and the TT series run version 3 and finally the Falcon had number 4. And even there was a specific version for the Milan which was 4.08 which was also a little bit further developed. We need to talk a little bit about emulators, but I already talked a lot about emulators and also showed how to use an emulator in my Kawaii K4R video. So this is also down in the links and check out that videos to learn about how to use the Steam emulator, for example, and even run MIDI software on these devices. So if we talk about software, sure, all the videos or most of the videos are found in there were about games and we need to mention some of them. There was King's Quest, all the Sarah online games, which I loved to death. And then also some arcade classics like Arkanoid. And then Dungeon Master was a big thing for all people who love RPGs because you could walk through dungeons with funny monsters and things like that. And still up today, it's a very nice game to play and then we had text adventures but with graphics so the pawn was a real classic which drove me crazy and just two weeks to play through it and it's just an insane game with crazy riddles and i think everybody should experience that and you can find all these software in the internet so it's pretty easy to find and run in an emulator so you can really get the experience from back then on your pc mac or linux system but we are not here to talk about gaming, we're here to talk about music. And I said in the beginning, it was in every home and professional studio. And what you noticed in all those pictures, there is also a tape machine with it. So back then you had to record your audio, not in digital in your computer, you recorded it on tape. So you needed to have a tape machine as well. And now the question is, how could you sync the audio of your tape machine with your computer playing the MIDI via your synthesizer. So to the rescue, SMPTE timecode. SMPTE stands for the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers and they developed the standard to synchronize such machines and there were hardware for that quite a lot. So one here is from C-Lab, which were, I already mentioned, they distributed the Falcon later on in their specific models and you could put that into the cartridge port and not only got SMPTE output, you also got additional MIDI inputs and outputs and you you also needed dongles because the cracker scene was really big and pirate copying was really an issue for the company. So you had to have dongles to protect your software and then you needed big items to put all these dongles in for the different software. So here, for example, from C-Lab, there was a combiner to collect these different dongles and run it with your ST. And the same thing was available from Steinberg, so the Midex Plus, which had also the ability to host dongles in there, you got additional MIDI inputs and outputs as well as the SMPTE synchronization. Yeah, so switching over to software, so the Atari ST was really the dawn of the DAW. So digital audio workstations were basically invented on Atari ST. Sure, there were similar software on other devices as well, but what happened on the ST with the Jam user interface is that they developed this user interface and the DOS nowadays inherited most of these things. So if you look at Cubase, it looks so similar in many, many ways to the current versions which you can still buy nowadays. And they had this classic concept with a 
tracks on the left and these arrange a few on the right hand side and the most famous one were the Cubase for sure and before that there was 24 also in different versions and from C-Lab they had the famous creator and notator software. The creator was more clips based not like in Ableton nowadays but you had these different clips and these clips could be arranged then to a song and notator also had here the ability to print out notes and arrange them in a music sheet. For sure also Logic Pro came up and was there first on Atari ST from Imagic which now belongs to Apple and we all know the story they ditched all other platforms so it's Apple only but nevertheless it came also from these things and I was really wondering if the Atari ST is the reason for that that most of the software music tech companies are coming from Germany and maybe the reason the Atari ST was so famous in Germany could be a reason for that because it was so cheap to get an Atari ST. It had a really great monitor for doing such tasks and it was easy to program and really easy to learn. So yeah, maybe something to think about. Yeah, and the last inception of Cubase was Cubase Audio, which was really insane. You could get an external hardware from Yamaha as well. So the CBXD5 was an external uh, audio card, basically, which allowed to record four tracks, so four audio mono tracks at once into the Atari Falcon and also playback 16 tracks. I think it's a was first eight and later on 16 and so for that time totally crazy it was still very expensive so you had to pay 5000 uh, Deutschmark for that which is about nowadays I guess uh, three or four thousand euro so uh, quite a big amount but for the time what you had to pay for a similar system it was really really cheap and great entrance into this professional digital recording and again if you look at these pictures you find still a lot of similarities to the Cubase, how it looks nowadays. For example, here, these few of all the envelopes looks totally identical still up till today. And for sure, there were also lots of trackers. And funnily enough, one of the most well-known ones, the Ace Tracker, even got an update in 2014, a version 2. So there are still people actively developing new Atari ST software up till now. And if you want to find out about the software that was available or still is available for the Atari ST series, a good start is the Atari International TOS software <laughs> catalog, which I had no idea that something like this existed, which is from 92. So it should contain the most well-known software because it was a pretty late release. And if we flip through the pages, there is one whole section about music and it's 86 pages with music software and you find Find all the famous stuff in there like the creator notator and yeah this is something we need to talk about in the late 980s a certain Jimmy Hot was making the rounds in the music industry by introducing musicians to the wonders of MIDI and in particular Atari computers and as you see on the picture Fleetwood Mac for example but also members of Yes and Tangerine Dream as well as BB King and the Pointer Sisters were a few of his clients but he had this new idea idea to come up with this evolved new device which he called now translator technology and the HOTS MIDI translator which was mainly a software in the beginning so the software we just saw but then he had the idea to also build a hardware device out of that and if you look especially at the smaller device I think there comes comparison into our minds like the Roly systems nowadays or MP controllers and I think these ideas also maybe originated from this good old hotspots and it was distributed together with Atari as well. And something that came really out of the blue is there was even a software called Live. It was not Ableton Live, but it was from a Berlin company as well, but from a different one. And it had nothing to do with uh, Ableton Live as we know today. But I found it pretty interesting that there was already a sequence back then from Berlin, which was called Live. 
But there are lots of other sources where you can find Atari ST software, mainly games, but there is also a very good site. It's called Atari Up to Date, which gives you lots of programs about MIDI and audio. And there you will also find what their latest versions were. And yeah, pretty nice site to dive into and find out new software. And then the side which really sent me down this rabbit hole of this journey is the homepage of the ST Computer Magazine. This was a magazine I read back in the day when I had an Atari ST and this was available since 86 and it's running still today. So next issue is to be expected any day now. <laughs> so it's expected to be in August 2024. It's unbelievable. So this is the longest running magazine for Atari ST. ST computers and you can download all of these issues as a PDF and read about all these old things and yeah I got lost into that and read through all, <laughs> all of them and yeah maybe a good idea for a long lonely winter. But there are also lots of books available nowadays and some things I stumbled over is this series of three books so Breaking the Borders, Beyond the Borders and Return of the Borders. And the first one is about the whole demo scene, which created demos for the Atari ST. And also the other two follow books contains a lot of trivia and interesting information about these days of the Atari ST. So, and there's also on their page, it's currently reduced, so you can get them quite cheap. All these links are also down in the description of the video if you're curious about these books. And something I just stumbled over this week is from Zephyr Books, which is one guy, I think from the UK, who writes books for himself but also sells these and he did two books about the history of Atari ST also some more books about games and also the Lynx and the Jaguar consoles and they are in order and if you want to know more about these books or if I should do a review just write me down in the comments and I can give you more info as soon as they hopefully arrive. Foo, so if you made it until here, thank you for watching this whole video because it was quite a lot of work to gather all this information together and did this video about these things. And please tell me down in the comments if you want to see more things like this. I was also trying to run, for example, Cubase and demo that with the emulator, but I had lots of issues with freezes. But if you're curious about these things, I will try again. So also write me down if you want to see such things, if I should demo old Atari ST software. And yeah, until next time, maybe with an Atari ST, create some funky music.